but we're going to have a look at nutritional aids here, okay? And the first nutritional aid we're going to address is simply the amount of food that was meant that was meant to be orange, uh, the amount of food that people should take. Okay, so a little bit of guideline here for you. If someone's averagely active, let's say me for example, I should be consuming five to seven grams of carbs per kilo of my body weight okay so it's a relative indicator but someone's active an athlete for example needs to be eating about double that per kilogram of their body mass so it's really useful that we have a look at that kind of a consideration now where i want to go next with this is to actually look at the timing of meals and you see here that we are recommending that people take on food three hours before performance and that that is low gi long lasting uh, brown rice uh, lentil this sort of thing low joe food and once they're participating, we're recommending between 60 and 90 grams of carbs per hour during. And then after exercise, we're saying eat as quickly as possible after. This is called the window, the, the um, sometimes called it glycogen window. And after exercise, it should be that we're taking on one to one and a half grams of carbs per kilo per hour. So there's wonderful guidance there with regard to how much should be taken on. Now, a couple of things I really wanna stress and why this is important. This can help us to increase glycogen stores. And we're gonna to come to this in a second because we're gonna actually look at glycogen lo uh, carbohydrate loading. But this is a really, really important process because we can therefore store more energy and that energy can be used for movement. Now with glycogen loading itself, and that's what we've got here, look, we've got the, this is sort of symbolic of glycogen-based foods or carbohydrate-based based foods. The key point I want to get across to you is that this is not just having a bowl of pasta the night before you do a running race. It's a seven day process where on day one, you deplete your glycogen, you don't take on any carbohydrates. On day two and three, you increase your fat and protein intake. It's a bit of a keto structure in that sense. On day four, you deplete glycogen further. And on day five to seven, that's when you reintroduce the carbohydrate rich diet. Now, why would we go about doing this? Well, first of all, we do it because we can get up to 50 percent more glycogen stored so our glycogen of course is stored in our liver and on our muscle tissue and if we can store 50 percent more of it that's the fuel source for the aerobic and the glycolytic system that's beneficial it also means it's longer to fatigue so we are going to take far longer to reach that kind of got nothing left stage Therefore, it's going to up arrow, it's going to increase our endurance capacities, okay? Now, there are negatives to this, okay? So we've got, for example, hypoglycemia. In the week before, you may well find yourself with very, very low blood sugar, for example. You might experience lethargy. But the other thing it does is it leads, leads to water retention, water retention we could sort of describe that as bloating or gastrointestinal problems these are the some of the drawbacks when it comes to glycogen loading now we're getting there folks we're now talking simply about water rehydration why what do we need to do here well we need to take on board one liter of water for each kilogram of mass lost in sweat okay so if we sweat out a kilogram of mass we need to replace that with a liter of water what are the positives to this well first of all obviously we prevent dehydration we pre prevent dehydration we prevent dehydration secondly we're also going to prevent loss of electrolytes loss of electrolytes thirdly we're going to maintain heat regulation so the temperature of the body is going to stay consistently at that sort of 37 degrees plus minus um plus or minus two um, we're also going to find that we're going to maintain blood viscosity. So blood viscosity is going to stay where it really should be. Now, finally, on this one, it's going to prevent CV drift. We've talked about that already, the tendency for heart rate to rise later on in exercise. We're going to get less fatigue as a result of that, which is really, really positive. And we are going to have less chance of cramps and that's particularly related to those electrolytes. There's nothing negative. You basically can't overwater yourself. Now, we're gonna finish off strong. We're gonna look at uh, creatine. Creatine, obviously, is the fuel source for the creatine phosphate system. It, we get it from meat and fish, it's amino acids, and the tendency is we take it in the form of creatine monohydrate as a supplement, okay? Now, uh, oh, I, tell you, I tell you what, folks, I, oh yeah, we've got caffeine. I thought I'd missed caffeine there for a second. So with creatine, what we're saying is we get more PC stores. Of course, for any sort of explosive performer, this is really, really valuable. We get an increased length 
of high intensity movement, of high intensity activity. So we do it high intensity for longer. Um, but there are negatives here. It can increase weight, so we can effectively get heavier, you know, that's not always necessarily a good thing. And it can also increase water retention. So that sort of bloating factor that I mentioned previously when we talked about carbohydrate glycogen loading. Now, let's take this further, a couple more to go. We're gonna talk about caffeine now. Caffeine, of course, is a stimulant. You might be wondering why, really, do athletes take stimulants via uh, caffeine, uh, via coffee? Yeah, well, coffee is quite a strong one, but we may take this in sort of pill format as well. So a couple of things about caffeine. It increases activity of the CNS. Okay, it increases activity of the CNS. That's what it does. Therefore, it increases alertness. So anything which has got reaction time type considerations, often open skills are a good example of this, though not always, um, that's gonna be really interesting. They also increase aerobic capacity. Now this has got an interesting point. Why do they make us more aerobically capable? Well, the reason for that is it increases fat metabolism and particularly, the capacity to transport fat, glycerol and fatty acids in the blood, we become better at that. Therefore, we're able to preserve glycogen. What do I mean by preserve glycogen? Well, obviously, if we're able to process fat more efficiently, we can use glycogen more when it's needed, but there are problems with caffeine. First of all, it is a diuretic. It causes dehydration, it causes water loss. It can obviously cause things like insomnia. There'll be people listening to this who um, are probably kind of caffeine addicts, I would, I would imagine. And it is acidic and this can lead to gastrointestinal problems. Now we've got two to go and you're hanging in well with me. The bicarbonate model, now it's, it's an interesting one for me because there's bicarbonate all over my house because we use it for all kinds of cleaning products and stuff. But we can also use bicarbonate as, not just for our baking or our cleaning, but we can also use it um, in as a supplement. So it's HCO3 minus, binds with hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ion, by the way, of course, is produced as one of the products of lactic acid when it breaks down. It then converts carbonic acid, which is then converted into CO2 and water and can be breathed out at the lung. Fine, what does this do? It increases our buffering capacity. If you're not sure what buffering is, I've got other tutorials on this, but specifically it's the removal of lactic acid during performance. It also delays OBLA. Okay, so OBLA is delayed through this process. And there are a couple of negatives here. First of all, that was meant to be read, when you take it, it's unpleasant. This is an alkaline, it's not a particularly pleasant thing to shove down your neck and it can lead to tummy ache. Now, those of you who studied all of the yoga age with me so far, you're hanging in there well, we've got one to cover. We've got nitrate. A nitrate one, I mean, I actually personally don't know anyone that uses nitrate, but it is a relatively popular um, performance supplement. So what is it? It's an inorganic compound naturally occurring in root vegetables It's stored in the body as nitrite, okay? So you chemists will probably tell me far more about this, but what does it do? It decreases blood pressure, which of course can help particularly from the perspective of, you know, getting really healthy stroke volume and cardiac output. Okay, so it decreases blood pressure. We're also gonna say um, that it has some negatives. It can, for example, cause headaches, and it can, for example, cause dizziness. You know, that might be because the blood pressure is a little bit lower, for example, and it's also carcinogenic which means it's a very light form form of poison and in higher quantities can lead to uh, unpleasant conditions and potentially cancer. So, you know, we don't want to be necking this stuff left, right and centre, but this, of course, is standardised stuff and it's SIS, I'm sure, are a reputable brand, sport, as science and sport. Now, we've gone over a lot of material there. This has been a long tutorial. I may well have split it into two by the time you come to use it, but I just want to summarise by talking about the fact that we have evaluated every method and that's what this is about cheers